Welcome to another post-coronavirus sociological theory lectures. Uh, tonight's lecture is on Irving Goffman's Asylums. Um, it's his 1961 book that's based on his ethnographic research conducted inside of St. Elizabeth's Hospital, a 7,000-bed um, mental health facility on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. Um, and it's, you know, my, the, the copy that I have students use is just, you know, any of the paperback versions. This is the Anchor Books uh, copy. Uh, like all of my copies of, of Goffman's books, um, starting to get kind of beat up. Um, I actually found my, my old copy of Frame Analysis uh, today that literally is held together with, uh, with electrician's tape and has been dropped and beaten. And um, anyhow, it's, it's uh, literally falling apart. But at any rate, um, you know, Goffman is a theorist I was uh, taken with when I was a, an early um, a sociologist. He, he continues to fall in my estimation. I, 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 I don't think he is, um, I think he's a little bit overrated, but, um, but I nevertheless like using uh, this book um, as the sort of anchor point for my contemporary sociological theory seminar, my, my graduate seminar. So um, we need to talk a little bit about why I use it and uh, some of the strengths and weaknesses of the book before we get going. So um, like all of Goffman's books, one of its real strengths is that it's accessible, right? That he writes in an intelligent way, um, and he seems to have almost like the magic formula figured out, uh, balancing conceptual writing with vivid illustration. So he just seems to know as he's writing when a good illustration is needed, and he seems to have... Um, a wealth of, of very vivid um, uh, material, both from his own uh, ethnographic research as well as from literature and other people's studies, that he's constantly grabbing hold of and presenting to his reader to help uh, uh, make points. And I think that that is always one of his, his great strengths. Um, so, the, um, so, so his writing is very good. Um, he also takes care of the reader as he's going through, so there's lots of little summations and and sort of uh, maps of the of uh, of his argument, and he makes um, he takes care to have summations along the way so that you can test yourself to make sure that you're following his main argument and so on. So he's good at that. Um, so that's good. So just the writing quality, students can actually. Um, uh, get inside of his text and make make their way uh, without much help from me needed. Um, a second reason I like uh, the book, and this is both a strength and a weakness, is that uh, this is Goffman's uh, uh, most organizational book. It's the one where he sort of cites organizational literature uh, uh, most completely. So it gives us a fairly good summation of where the state of organizational sociology and organizational theory within sociology um, uh, was at in mid 20th century. So, you know, the book was written very, very late 1950s, 1960, published in 61. And so this is coming uh, out at about the same time as, as other sort of great texts like, um, you know, Melville Dalton's Men Who Manage, more about that in just a minute. Um, you know, uh, Elvin Gouldner's Patterns of Industrial Bureaucracy, um, you know, Reinhard Benig's work in authority and industry. You know, so in the mid-20th century, the link between sociology and business schools and schools of management and administrative science and, and industrial organization and even industrial psychology, that, that, that these, these uh, fields that sort of flourished and then split off um, were tightly coupled with sociology and in many ways grew out of sociology. Many European sociology departments maintain close ties yet um, to those in organizational studies or business management. Uh, here in America, those ties were severed by the 70s. So Goffman is using, you know, essentially um, mainstream uh, business management and organizational theory literature in his uh, framing of this book as he's working through you know, other great books like The Organization Man, uh, William White's account of the uh, spread of organizations in the mid-20th century. Um, you know, may, may, maybe what we should do is, is, is talk about some of the weaknesses, strengths and weaknesses of the book. So Goffman does a fair job, again, of sort of summary, summarizing uh, the state of organizational sociology in um, 1960. So, and that's one of the reasons why I like the book, because it... Um, um, 
in the post-World War II period, you know, the state had risen in power everywhere in global capitalism, and um, bu bureaucratic organizations had spread everywhere, and complex organizations had become normalized, and most of us spent uh, most of our life uh, outside of small primary groups or small, uh, uh, you know, family groups or small neighborhoods, and instead, you know, went to mass schools. Um, I was just asking my students last night how large their schools were that they went to. Most of them went to high schools uh, with well over, you know, like like 2,000 students. Some had uh, well over 1,000 students in their graduating class. So, um, you know, mass schools, uh, you know, mass retail, uh, mass uh, production facilities, mass offices, mass employers, mass universities like this one, which has, you know, 35,000 plus students, um, and, you know, militaries on a mass scale. Um, so, so, so the size and scale of organizations had grown immensely throughout global modernity uh, in, in the years after World War II. So, so there was a kind of a new awareness that um, whatever it was that uh, made us social, in the post uh, World War II era, um, we were going to have to fit into and become a part of formal, formally organized uh, bureaucratic complex uh, organizations. Okay, so uh, so this problem, the problem of 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 large scale organization and of life within it, was just you know in the air uh, in sociology and other fields. So, so Goffman, do, again, does a fair job of summary, but in, in all of Goffman's work, uh, he does a poor job of, of I, I guess there's another way to put it, of, of, of citing and um, attributing ideas to his predecessors and fellow travelers. He tends to overstate his own originality, and it's kind of irritating in this book. So, uh, so for example, he really uh, makes a big deal in the early uh, sections of asylums of the divide between, um, um, you know, the inmate and staff, right? That the staff-inmate distinction uh, structures everything. Uh, there's a footnote on page seven where he attributes this binary character that everything in a, comp in, in, in a total institution is determined by your position as either a staff member or an inmate. And he attributes that ultimately to Gregory Bateson here, and so he gives him a little bit of of, um, of credit. But then he says, you know, this is widespread in the field. And and and, and he, again, in, in a way, um, he's attributing it to someone, but, but, but the originality of his work is overstated because it doesn't um, um, give um, expression to um, the parallels in the uh, management literature uh, of the time. So maybe I just need to demonstrate it. So, um, so like in, um, yeah, so like in Melville Dalton's book, Men Who Manage, a, a nice sexist title there, um, you know, he makes a big deal about the uh, division between management and labor, and even between two subsections of management, between the, the line staff and the, um, yeah, excuse me, the line managers and the staff managers, the people who are doing functional jobs like accounting or engineering or something, and those who are actually managing the production facilities. Um, you know, in, in the mid-20th century, I just love Dalton's book. Um, I mean, look at this. He includes, you know, this neat fold-out um, organization chart for uh, the um, Milo Corporation, which is one of the uh, case studies that he has, right? I mean, it just goes on and on. I have to stretches out over four pages so you know you you're trying to sort of make sense of the complexity of organizations the way that the the the, uh, the position that you occupy in the organization determines your day-to-day -day life determines uh your relations it determines how you uh, orient yourself to the world right that you are determined by your position uh within the organizational structure so that's one of the things that goffin makes um uh you know central to um to asylums uh, but again, it's it's there. It's it's all over uh, the management literature at the time. Other things, you know, Goffman spends a lot of time in all of his work contrasting the formal and the informal. That there's a formal structure, then a kind of an informal way that uh, that um, organizations function. Total institutions, we're going to find out, have a kind of official line. We're here to help patients, or we're here to uh, correct uh, inmates, and that official line tends to structure the formality, the formal side of the organization, but that there's always informal things as well, right? And the informal tends to matter more than the formal. 
So like Melville Dalton, when he's uh, uh, trying to I explain why, um, uh, why, um, you know, how do people get promoted? Uh, what matters when people get promoted? He has this long section on race relations and, and the way that, that, um, that different races are treated within the organization, uh, that managers relate to blacks and to Southern whites who tend to be much more racist than Northern whites. Um, uh, Southern whites wind up uh, uh, getting very violent when they work next to um, uh, black workers. Uh, they get really violent and angry if they find out that a black worker makes more than they do, or if a black worker gets promoted before they do, and so on. So, so there's kind of this 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 um, incredibly detailed account of the way that race operates within mid 20th century corporations um, as an informal factor. It's not really part of the formal structure. It's informal, but nevertheless, uh, you know, really structures what goes on. Even all these kind of these secret ways of marking down uh, uh, black employees, you know, indicating that their that their test results didn't come back very well and therefore aren't eligible for promotion and so on, or making black uh, job applicants go through multiple days of training prior to uh, uh, taking a position with a paycheck, whereas white employees just get hired and are on the job within hours, right? So, so you know, those informal things. Um, other informal aspects. Uh, what does it take to get promoted? Uh, he talks about, uh, yeah, that the career ladder is um, determined not only by ability, but by such informal things as whether you are, quote, a sucker and a joiner, a suck ass and a joiner, those kinds of things, right? Um, whether you join the yacht club uh, that the other managers are in or whether you join the Masons, uh, whether you're a member of a Protestant church or a Catholic church or not church bound at all uh, matters. So these unofficial informal requirements um, are tracked by Dalton and again are widespread within the organizational literature at the time. So here's a section on Masonic membership, um, you know, church membership, uh, and, and how that matters and so on. Um, you know, so, so again, these are these informal things that, uh, you know, Goffman spends quite a bit of time uh, interested in are things that Dalton does too. So here's like a section on unofficial incentives that workers who um, can't get more pay because they're at a certain great, uh, uh, you know, pay scale get extra compensation in the form of being able to take um, supplies and materials home. Some managers get extra compensation by having their cars tuned or uh, maintenance done or even cleaned um, by uh, staff workers. And, you know, you know, literally pulling machinists away from working on uh, factory uh, things to do uh, jobs for uh, for managers and so on. Again, it's a kind of a way to get extra extra pay. And then, you know, as he writes about that, this that the, the worker that does this, that waxes the boss's car winds up um, having a kind of informal tie to the boss that you would not otherwise get. So you get kind of socially elevated a little bit among your fellow workers. So there's a kind of, um, I don't know, a psychological premium that's paid uh, to the worker who engages in this activity, right? So there's all kinds of things here. You know, people who take food home, who take, uh, um, you know, who supplement their income in other ways. So there's all kinds of informal and unofficial things that are located within uh, within the management literature, as well as, again, this, this, this real strong emphasis upon um, the structural division between management and labor, and again, between different, um, uh, you know, managers uh, within that really complex uh, organizational structure. You know, Reinhard Bendix um, um, and... Um, well, it, actually, w William White's uh, book on um, Organization Man, um, you know, he spends a lot of time just, again, detailing what happens to people who aren't in total institutions like asylums, but who nevertheless find themselves inside of, of a bureaucratic organization for life in the mid-20th century. And he claims that you wind up getting all of this uh, the uh, pressure for conformity. And that uh, that to be a good organization man is to be someone who uh, you know places the, the the work organization above the self and so on. He claims there's all kinds of psychological testing that was being done at the time. He um, he he created a fake identification card that would list all of one's uh, sort of um, um, psychological uh, profiles and personality profiles and. And so on. He did that as a joke in mid 20th century, and then found out that some corporate managers thought it was such a good idea that they wound up adopting it. 
like like creating something like you know those bizarre 1950s and 60s uh, punch cards uh, that would give not only you know someone's position but their job history um, and some of their aptitudes and so on 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 a simple card. So you were measured and then promoted not only based upon what people thought of your work, but upon the answers to questions uh, conducted by, you know, sort of social scientists, um, you know, asking you, you know, like what your opinion was, uh, indicate whether you agree, disagree or uncertain about if you're going to hell, if you think pink spots, if you ever get pink spots, love yourself, or if you think sex acts are repul repulsive, or if you think strong minded women are a problem, or if your father was a tyrant and and so on. So, so, you know, like he says, like, like you figure this out, like, what should you answer? He gives, he tells you just always be inoffensive in whatever answer you do give. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, word association tests are here. You know, when you hear the word naked, what do you associate it with or the word autumn um, and so on. Um, so at any rate, it's, it's, it's these, that, that life within complex organizations, even those that weren't total was kind of all-consuming. It had a kind of sovereignty about it in that 20th century people living in capitalist modernity were being reconstructed in these organizations. Um, and 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 so, so, so again, Goffman is sort of uh, uh, playing inside of a literature that's much bigger than what he's presenting here. And, um, and, and, and again, he kind of, it kind of overstates his, his originality. Um, so I, I just wanted to just just to sort of point this out uh, before we go. So like 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 um, the um, you know much of the organization bureaucratic organization mid twentieth century, especially of factories and of uh, of work that required physical manipulation, um, was uh, shaped by management uh, scientific managers or time motion study people. Um, I have a copy of Cheaper by the Dozen. It's this uh, kind of fictionalized or memoir written by one of the children of Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, two of the um, uh, uh, most famous um, um, you know, scientific managers of the 20th century. I actually have a couple of hand, a handwritten note by Lillian Gilbreth and her daughter um, in this um, particular book. But, um, but at any rate, it, you, you know, the, the way that organizations where structure was often scientific, um, the kind of natural organization uh, where one worker hands work off to another um, that had been sort of like traditionally established is blown away. And you wind up with a new sort of scientifically modeled detailed division of labor became typical. So it meant that people who went into work organizations had to sort of give up uh, control of the execution. It, 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 they basically were executing managerial plans that were determined by others, right? That, that in in in, um, in in Braverman's terms, there was a distinction made between the planning of work and the execution of work, and the planning was done by management and managerial experts and time motion experts, right? And then the the workers had to be more compliant than they had been in the past because they must not do work in the way that they see fit, but do work as they are told to do. Okay, so um, in Cheaper by the Dozen, there's a chapter called Motion Study Tonsils that um, that describes um, uh, Frank Gilbreth gets a contract, basically, um, from a surgeon or from, from um, to, to, to do a time motion study of surgery to try to reduce the amount of time that someone would need to be anesthetized. Um, while surgery was taking place, and uh, so they so they would film it and 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 uh, the surgery taking place, and he would try to eliminate the unnecessary tasks, try to redistribute tasks in a division of labor, so that you would have a nurse like you know slapping instruments into the hands of the doctor and so on, having it done very very efficiently. This is all from the 1930s, and um, and uh, in this chapter, in order to um, facilitate his time motion study of surgery, he decided to, to study um, tonsils being removed from patients. Uh, it's kind of hard to find a whole bunch of uh, people needing tonsils removed. So since he had 12 children, he had all of his children's tonsils removed um, in their own home. So they set up a kind of mini surgery in their, in their parlor, in their house. And then his 12 children and himself all had uh, their tonsils removed. And they did it um, while filming it in order to, again, to, to, to see which uh, movements made by the surgeon were necessary, which ones were efficient, which ones were extraneous and could be removed. 
And so, and, and so these kind of time motion studies were everywhere, right? And that this is what dictated work everywhere. So workers were compliant, and someone like Frank Gilbreth doing a study of other people's work uh, dictated, even to a surgeon, how knots were to be tied uh, uh, during surgery and so on. And so, um, so yeah, he said, you know, surgeons aren't any different from, from skilled mechanics, and therefore my time motion study uh, can be used for them as well. So, yeah, they, they wound up, again, all 12 kids were run through um, and had their tonsils removed. One of the kids, though, had really healthy tonsils, um, and Martha, and so she was not going to have her tonsils removed. So she hadn't uh, fasted, I think, the day before the surgery was to be conducted. Um, she accidentally, um, um, let me see, how did this work? The doctor who was performing the tasks um, thought he had grabbed Martha. Turned out he hadn't, uh, the, 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 but, but he thought he had the child that shouldn't have surgery done. Um, and he knocked her out and then said, whoops, I knocked the wrong kid out. She shouldn't have her tonsils out. Hers are good. Uh, so let's let her go. And the father said, no, nah, just go ahead and take her tonsils out. <laughs> anyway, we're filming. And so he took her tonsils out anyway. And then it turns out that that wasn't Martha, the one who shouldn't have her tonsils out. It was Ernestine, who's who um, who's who signed the, uh, this copy of the book. And then uh, how does this go? So so um, Mar Martha was then nevertheless, uh, even though she hadn't been accidentally uh, placed under anesthesia and had her tonsils removed, was nevertheless grabbed and made to have her tonsils taken out anyway. And then it all ended with Frank having his tonsils removed and he was quite sick at the end of it. And uh, so the idea is that he farmed his own children out and used them as guinea pigs to help um, uh, improve the time and motion efficiency of surgery. Now, the, the end of that, that chapter ends uh, that the man who was doing the filming had forgotten to take the lens cap off of the, off of the movie camera. So none of it was recorded. It was all for nothing. So the entire uh, 12 children and Gilbert himself, I don't know why I'm giggling about this. It isn't funny. All had their tonsils removed for nothing. Um, and, and, but, 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 but the point is, is that even in work as complex as surgery, with a, with, with a worker as skilled as a surgeon, you know, bureaucratic scientific management, uh, was separating out the planning of surgery from the execution of surgery so that the surgeon, the moves of the surgeon were predictated. It kind of de-skilled the surgeon's labor. And then that spread everywhere within modern organizations so that workers increasingly had to be compliant. Um, they were tended to be unionized, but the union wasn't very militant. So, you know, compliant uh, workers who got along uh, to get along and so on. So mid-20th century, at the time when Goffman writes his book, <clears throat> it looks like there's a new species of society coming into existence, high modern uh, capitalism, right? A, a world where the scale of organizations, of workplaces, of production facilities, of schools, of insane asylums, of hospitals, um, uh, uh, had grown so large, right? And that 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 um, in scientific management had spread so far um, that there was a kind of new style of person, kind of compliant, um, uh, you know, go along to get along anyway. All, all of that. So all of these works then from the mid twentieth century uh, are sort of aimed at helping us comprehend and understand uh, this new world. So that's why I have students start with Goffman's Asylums. Um, we are in the 21st century. We are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I'm recording this lecture because students can't come to class because of, um, of shutdowns and because of quarantine and because of just the general social distancing and um, protective uh, practices that are being deployed to try to keep the virus from spreading uh, uh, farther and faster than it can be handled. So, Students are spread out in their homes. They're doing their work on in, in, in parental bedrooms now. Um, there, it's a different world. So, so even the quintessential total institution, as we're going to talk about, the the prison. Um, you know, prisoners are being let go. Uh, they're, they're 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 having ankle bracelets, home confinement, house confinement instead of uh, prison terms. So, whatever remnants of total institutions were left. Uh, prior to the pandemic are shrinking even much more rapidly now. So it seems to me uh, that I always have a hard time sort of getting across to students what it was like 
to be alive in the mid-20th century. I was born in 65, so I kind of came of age in this world. Even though I'm from rural South Dakota, um, the the idea that I had of the world was one of very large-scale organization, bureaucratic efficiency, and, 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 and so on. Okay. So Goffman does a good job at taking us into that world, this world of massive state structures, of massive capitalist production structures that are bureaucratically organized, um, managed, and so on, and where there are structural positionings that determine uh, your conduct, determine your psychological uh, orientation uh, to work and to life, and that uh, determine the meaning of the action that you engage in, okay? Okay. So it's a very good account of mid-20th century life. So again, he kind of overstates his, his originality, but I just tried to demonstrate to you that some of the points that he makes, many of them at least, are, 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 are echoed or were, um, um, these points were already made in organizational studies in business schools and in, in sociology of organizations, um, uh, you know, scholarship, um, you know, prior to Goffman. So he's kind of echoing what was already there and just sort of taking that work and, and translating it into prisons and uh, insane asylums and, and um, um, you know, convents and other places. Okay. Make sense? All right. So to me... The real power then of Goffman's book is, um, is, again, he's writing at the sort of high point of, of high modern life, rooted in sort of organized industrial capitalism with large-scale social democratic states, with large-scale um, uh, militaries, with large-scale, uh, uh, again, bureaucratically uh, managed organizations everywhere. So it was a world that seemed to dominate the individual. There's a lot of sociology from that time really dealt with, uh, you know, the problems of individuality in mass society, that people were losing their capacity to act as individuals and so on. And so he's writing at a time when organizations were at almost their peak of power, and he's writing about organizations, total institutions like prisons and so on, that have more power than any other. In fact, he's writing about organizations that had more power than, again, any any um, uh, human group in, in in world history, right? Um, so information technology, bureaucratic organization, um, rigid walls, good, uh, you know, uh, a man, not good, but, but powerful practices of supervision and so on. Um, and so these are some of the most powerful institutions that we can that we can be a part of. So then the question is, if the what is life like inside of these institutions? Does freedom exist? What happens to the, the, the freedom of the subject or to individual subjectivity in the midst of life within something like a prison or an asylum or a convent? What happens to individuality and, and freedom within a large-scale corporation, within a military or a police unit or a, a large mass school for that matter? So, so, you know, this sort of sense of psychological alienation, this sense of being overwhelmed as just one atom within a larger mass, uh, a widespread problem. And Goffman sort of introduces 21st century students into that world and into that set of problems that were so widespread in the mid-20th century. Okay? So it's a, it, it just provides a good entry point into a world that has now been eroding or vanishing uh, for 60 years, right? Because there really are no more or very few um, state-sponsored large-scale uh, mental hospitals uh, like St. Elizabeth's. Um, you know, again, prisons are now privatized, but a lot of people get in uh, to prison systems. They're, they're on parole or they're not, uh, uh, again, there's home confinement and things. Uh, colleges and universities are changing very quickly. Um, uh, you know, work at home now is going to spread very widely. The, you know, the, uh, uh, the virtual uh, connections uh, that we all are maintaining are probably going to be a permanent part of life. So the total institutions seem to be in decline. So this is a world that has been vanishing, but, it's a, but, but, but to understand that world is to understand, uh, um, you know, post-World War II sociology. Uh, that was responding to this rise in organizational power and bureaucratic efficiency and so on and trying to comprehend uh, what individuals can do inside of, 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 of a world that's structured that powerfully. Okay. All right. So let's get inside of the book then uh, as best as we can. I have actually have, um, I, I, I often teach a, um, 
a graduate uh, leadership seminar on um, on organizations. And so I have a, actually a set of slides uh, that I use for that that I'll, I'll use today too. Okay, so here's Goffman's Asylums then. Okay, and it, it's really about the you know the the world as a of a total institution and what I want my students thinking about in my graduate theory class is to what degree is everyday life outside of an asylum uh, structured similarly to an asylum um, are the challenges to freedom that were typical of people inside of the asylum also uh, um, tip were these challenges also widespread outside as well okay all right, so so let, so let's begin our discussion then of of Goffman's book. So, so by mid twentieth century, sociologists were studying the way that complex organizations, bureaucracies, and total institutions, like Goffman looks at, had been overlaid upon the kind of primary groups: uh, families, clans, villages, um, you know, neighborhoods, uh, friendship groupings, and so on. Primary groups that had always existed and been part of of, uh, of, of human social life, right? Bureau bureaucratic complex organizations were something relatively new, at least new as a mass phenomenon. You know, most human beings may have been touched at moments in their lives by contact with a bureaucratic complex organization, but it's really only in modernity that this becomes uh, a widespread um, uh, experience. And it really is only in the post-World War II era that most modern subjects are spending probably the bulk of their life um, inside of or being touched by a bureaucratic complex organization. So this becomes the quintessential uh, sort of milieu or environment in which modern people find themselves, complex organizations. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip through some of this. So in, in traditional society, you know, following Hegel's uh, Phenomenology of Spirit, um, you know, the, the, the traditional societies, um, you know, like the core organizing structure is uh, the domi the person who, who has domination, who has power, and the person who is dominated, who doesn't. It's master-slave, um, lord and bondsman, if you want to use that uh, terminology instead, where, where, um, where the conduct of one's life the uh, meaning of one's actions, even the psychological sense of self that one has, is determined by one's status as either a person uh, who has power over others or a person who is dominated by others, you know, the master-slave dialectic. Well, Goffman recognizes that all co complex organizations, just like Melville Dalton and, and Reinhard Bendix and others, that all complex organizations have a structure and where human beings are determined by their position within the organization. In prisons um, and uh, insane asylums and other total institutions, the divide, the structure that matters most is the divide between staff and inmates. So today's lecture is really all about the way that the staff and the inmate position, that that role, that that structural position determines uh, your conduct and the meaning of your life, right? And that... Um, um, and so whatever your position was outside of the total institution, once inside of it, your conduct is, is, is totally determined by it, okay? So in total institutions, the structural division between staff and inmates is much greater, much stronger, the distance is much larger than it is between, say, management and labor inside of a production facility or between, say, students and professors inside of a university uh, or between something like, uh, you know, the government official and the people who are processed by the government agency uh, in everyday life, that, they, that the distance is pretty total in uh, total institutions. Okay. So what are total institutions then? Okay, well, they are all-encompassing social establishments um, that are symbolized, you know, with a barrier. There's a wall. As Donald Trump says, build that wall. Um, and there's usually a wall surrounding uh, a total institution. Okay, so again, a prison, walls, uh, an asylum, walls, a, um, a boarding school surrounded by walls. Um, so there's some sort of physical barrier to social interaction that do, that really separates off those who are in, right, who are inside, from those that are out. Okay. 
So there are physical barriers blocking the inmates who are inside, inmates, they, they are inside, from departing and, um, and outsiders from getting in. So locked doors, high walls, barbed wire, cliffs, forests, that kind of thing. You know, we just saw, I'm recording this in January of 2021. We just saw in the wake of the, um, you know, the January 6th insurrection that the, uh, at the entire uh, perimeter of the uh, Capitol, United States Capitol was turned into something like a total institution with a razor wire and barriers being put up to prevent ingress and egress. Um, uh, or at least uncontrolled ingress and egress out of the out of, out of the building. Okay, so total institutions enter social arrangements that limit contact between inmates and outsiders. There's usually even mail that is censored. Uh, visitors are, are censored or, or, or um, heavily supervised. Um, media, there's usually some sort of uh, uh, you know uh, censorship of the media that gets in and out. There are five different sort of varieties or subspecies of total institutions that Goffman writes about. Um, number one are those that are established to care for those who are incapable of caring for themselves, uh, but are not a threat. They're harmless to others. So this is like homes for the blind, for the aged, for the orphaned, uh, for the poor. Uh, number two are those where uh, that are established to care for people who can't care for themselves, but are potential harm to others. That's like mental asylums, uh, lazar houses, or you know houses of a uh, you know uh, leprosy. You know it's really interesting in the middle of the coronavirus. Uh, emergency wards, I think emergency wards, but intensive care wards um, have to a degree, or COVID wards have taken on this quality. People can't care for themselves, but they are a threat to others. And then you get this sort of this wall established where, um, you know, relatives can't come and visit and so on. So, the, so in a weird way during COVID, um, intensive care facilities have become almost a total institution. Okay, type number three are those uh, total institutions that are established to protect the community from harmful inmates, uh, and we don't really care that much about the welfare of, the in, uh, of those who are, so, who are incarcerated. So this is what jails are, penitentiaries, POW camps, concentration camps, um, and I used we there uh, very painfully. Um, concentration camps, POW camps, work camps, and so on are going to be very much at issue in all of the uh, texts we look at this semester. Um, uh, the fourth type are total institutions established to organize work and uh, or work like instrumental groups uh, for instrumental reasons. So this would be like military barracks, uh, naval vessels, uh, boot camps uh, within the military, boarding schools, um, you know, residential schools and so on, colonial compounds. All of these uh, are organized as a total institution. And then number five are those that are uh, total institutions established to provide a retreat from the world and training grounds for religious people. So monasteries, abbeys and convents. Okay, so those are the categories that he, he, he indicates there's probably more. Um, type 3 and type 4 are the types that we're going to see throughout the whole semester. And they're part of my major concern about the world going forward. The camp, concentration camps, POW camps, ICE camps, um, colonial compounds, um, you know, uh, military barracks, uh, boot camps. That These are, are phenomena that have... In, that that are really at issue uh, in the 20th century, and they're going to be at issue as we go on in the course. All right, so what are total institutions then? Again, all-encompassing, uh, rationally planned uh, uh, organizations that involve the batch processing of large numbers of inmates by a small bureaucratically organized staff. So there's usually a small staff processing and managing and surveying and supervising a much smaller, excuse me, much larger population of inmates. Um, and the inmates are, are batch processed. They're reduced to a number or to a unit. They're homogenized. Uh, they become uniform. And that term shows up everywhere here. So whatever your qualitative distinctions were outside of the total institution, once inside as an inmate, you get reduced down uh, to a uniform uh, uh, inmate at a particular grade. Okay, so total institutions are uniquely or even quintessentially modern institutions. They do not become widespread phenomena until really the post-World War II era. And then we're going to find that they begin to fade very quickly in about the 1970s. Um, okay, so there are several types of total institutions. We just saw that. Um, and then other institutions have just one or two uh, sort of structural features that distinguish them from Total institutions, so you know, again, large mass uh, high schools, um, mass universities, residential colleges. Um, they're not quite total institutions, but they're not that far from it, or at least there's moments within them uh, that they become it. You know, a, a hospital um, uh, has the same kind of features and so on. So um, workplaces, um, um, office buildings, um, 
especially after 9-11. Many office buildings have, have a kind of lockdown about them. We're, we're, we're managing uh, in and out. Okay, and again, the staff-inmate divide is the crucial distinction. So the primary structure and then all of the secondary structures are based are built on it is that divide or that distinction between the, the staff and the inmate. And in the book, then he talks about the inmate world, the moral career that begins with the mortification or the death of the civil self, the self that existed outside the organization. You kind of murder the soul of the inmate as they come in, and then... Um, and then you begin to build them up after that. So this mortification of the self, this loss of the self as you come inside of the total institution is something that Goffman really writes about. And again, just to mention that the organizational literature, like we're looking at William White's book, he's really worried about you know managers and corporations losing their soul as they get inside, having to give up large parts of the self. Here's an image of, of that 7,000 bed hospital, St. Elizabeth's Hospital outside of Washington, D.C., uh, that that Goffin uh, worked in, and and the again, it still exists. The building is still there. At least I think it's still there. And the grounds have been redeployed as the Department of Homeland Security. Okay, so what puts the total in total institutions? Well, one citation Goffin fails to make is to uh, Marcel Mauss's uh, "The Gift," and so that's a book where uh, Mauss argues that gifts and prestations and Potlatches become a total institution that organizes all of, of the tribal life of a group that, um, that engages in gift exchange. And so here we've got the same kind of thing, that, 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 that the total institution is total in that it encompasses all of life, right? Everything is subordinated to the law or the rule of the total institution. So on the outside of the total institution, in modern life, there's a kind of daily round of activity, activities that are segregated from each other. Three separate phases that occur in three separate social establishments. We tend to work time on in factories, offices, and schools, bureaucratically organized and managed. We then play and time off uh, uh, in leisure. We do that in recreation grounds, non-bedroom part of homes, bars, um, you know, uh, workout facilities, and so on. And then we sleep or do some of the other basic body functions, um, time away in bedrooms, in homes, or other, other private spaces within homes. So, so these three regions of life, work, play, and sleep, are organized uh, apart from each other. They're segregated. Uh, there isn't one sort of, um, sort of uh, bureaucracy. There isn't one sort of regime. There isn't one sort of... Um, uh, you know, authority structure that dictates what happens here. So at any rate, in total institutions, these three realms collapse onto each other. So um, you work, play, and sleep in the same place and under the same authority with the same others. That's what batch living is all about. You can't get away from the people you're, you're sleeping. You're sleeping with the people you work with. You're playing with the people you work with. Um, and, you, you know, again, so it's that these three realms of life are, are collapsed onto each other. Um, and then all of life then becomes bureaucratically scheduled and coordinated to get a system of formal rules, formal officials that govern everything, including these realms of life like play, sleep, eating, uh, private activity, bodily excretions, and so on that are usually left up to the individual's discretion have to be planned for and organizationally provided for in some way. So it's a much more all-encompassing bureaucratic structure than what you would find in like a workplace uh, because all of the needs of life must be met. So all activities then are governed by a single rational plan to fulfill the ends or aims of the organization. So again, it's formal, rational, bureaucratic planning of the full round of social life, everything. Somebody has to plan where you sleep and how you sleep. Somebody has to plan where and when you defecate. Somebody has to figure out how you're going to eat, where you're going to get medicine, um, where you're going to get your teeth cleaned, uh, where you're going to get your hair cut. Um, where you're going to get medical care of any kind, right? Uh, where you're going to find love, if you're going to find it, or where you're going to take care of any of the other bodily needs. Get exercise. Any of these aspects of life all have to be bureaucratically planned for and arranged, right? So it's sort of like, like you know, military logistics become a part of uh, the management uh, tasks of a total institution. So you wind up handling many human needs by the bureaucratic organization, and you're managing whole blocks of people at once okay so therefore you wind up with bureaucratic efficiency when with inside of total institutions right when inmates are organized in blocks and batch processed it's much more efficient than customized one-on-one -on -one treatment so so there so when we're caring for people in a total institution it's much more uh, a labor there's a lot of labor saving going on 
uh, by, by processing people in a uniform way in batches, right? So one teacher in a kindergarten can manage 25 kids, uh, it, you know, which would take like five or six mothers uh, doing like individual daycare or something to manage, right? That there's something efficient about having this kind of bureaucratically organized structure uh, around. Uh, it's maybe a bad example, but you get the point. It's just the efficiency block of, of, of batch processing. So large blocks of inmate center are managed by a small supervisory task. The primary goal of the hired personnel is not guidance or periodic, periodic inspection, but surveillance. And surveillance is kind of a key word here. Probably a better word, the one that we're more familiar with in this context is supervision. Super over vision sight. So overseeing or having oversight over people, watching them, controlling them, that kind of thing. Uh, you're not guiding them by giving them advice. You're actually managing them, controlling them, supervising them, right? Uh, hurting them in some way. So surveillance, surveying, uh, looking with the eyes, supervision with the eyes, overseeing with the eyes, right? That kind of thing. Um, so you're not, you're not there to help. You're there to control, to govern, to dictate, to control, right? So it's crucial to organize life so that one's personal infractions stand out in relief against the visible, constantly examined compliance of others. So in a bureaucratic organization, uh, a, a total institution, if everybody is, uh, is sleeping in cots arranged in rows, it's easy to see if somebody gets up. Um, if people are sitting in rows, it's very easy to see if someone's out of line or standing in rows. It's easy to see if someone's out of line. If everybody's wearing the same clothes, it's easy to see if someone is, is out of conformity, that kind of thing, right? So batch processing, reducing people to a uniform grade um, facilitates um, the efficiency of the organization. It's not good for the soul of the people who are being processed, but it allows it to be efficiently. Okay, so again, the basic structure of a total institution, of a jail, a prison, a convent, is the division between staff and inmates. So the staff-inmate divide is all-encompassing, uh, much more so than in non-total institutions, right? So again, the mid-century management literature makes so much of the distinction between labor and management, but the divide is much greater here. So these two classes, staff and inmate, are treated and viewed as two entirely different subspecies of human being, two entirely different sets of rights, privileges, and activities are attributed to each. The biggest difference, of course, is that the inmates live in that desegregated world with a very specific meaning to desegregation here. Work, sleep, play all takes place in the same space under the same authority structure. So the inmates live 24-7 within the total institution while the staff works 8 to 5, basically, or any other shift, and then leaves to play and sleep somewhere else. So social mobility between staff and inmates is grossly restricted. You usually can't. So there's huge social distance that's made between staff and inmates. It's formalized in. There's usually rules of fraternization that limit the capacity for staff and inmates to... to um, have uh, you know intimate or private relationships with each other, and then again, there are very few inmates that become staff members, and very few staff members who will willingly become inmates. And usually, there's all kinds of problems if either one of those happen. So uh, the projected attributes of staff and inmates. Uh, Goffman writes about this: that inmates often view other inmates as inferior, weak, and blameworthy, even guilty. Uh, staff tend to view inmates as bitter, secretive, and untrustworthy. Staff tends to view other staff as Siberian righteous, and inmates tend to view staff as condescending, high-handed, and mean. And so you wind up with these kind of stereotype projections um, and a kind of a kind of a false mirroring of the uh, uh, of the positions. So just to see here, we don't have uh, uh, reciprocity back and forth. That what each of the positions thinks of the other is out of alignment. So there's going to be quite a bit of of conflict built into uh, the management of total institutions. Okay, so Goffman begins then the section on the inmate world by describing the mortification of the civil self. So he argues that whatever you were outside in, in uh, outside of the total institution, before you went to jail, before you became an inmate in a mental institution, before you joined the convent, before you uh, joined the military, whatever you were like outside, that's going to be stripped away. It, mortification, mort, literally means die. So you're dying. This old self, the soul that you had before you came in is going to die. And so uh, much of the intake uh, the inner, the first, the processing, the welcome, as he calls it, into the total institution is going to be about killing off the social self, removing individuality, removing the traits. And I've got this image here of this patient inside of a total institution 
um, who has been de-loused, de-clothed, had his head shaved, and so on. And you literally wind up, Goffman says, naked halfway through, right? That all of the old features of the civil self are removed, and then uh, you wind up getting a uniform graded self imposed upon you. So the family, the civil self that you had outside, the intimates that you had outside, are, uh, are cut off from you once you're inside. So the inmate loses contact with the family and others on the outside world, which is very demoralizing. Uh, the morality that you had, the ethical structure you had outside ceases to exist, and then the self itself gets killed. So you are mortified to the civil self. You die a civil death. Um, so you're coughing your family. Um, yeah, um, so the three, and in fact, he says that if you have a normal concern for your external family, if you're normally like a good father or mother or care about your children or something, that, that being inside of the total institution is going to be seen as a very, very um, disruptive thing. So there's three great props of the external life identity, uh, the three main ways to keep the spirit or sense of self alive that are denied to inmates. Um, the respectful intimacy with those in close proximity with us. Uh, we often define ourselves in terms of other people's desire. And so that's going to be fussed with and interfered with by the uh, organization. Not going to, you're going to be ripped away from your current round of intimate relationships. And then there's going to be all kinds of restrictions imposed upon the formation of new ones. Um, and you're not going to be able to determine who you, who you are intimate with. And, and I don't mean just sexually. I mean like friends and other things. Uh, work and the respectful accomplishment of work is something that's disrupted. Um, you're not going to be paid for your work. And if you are paid, it's just going to be a kind of uh, nominal uh, payment. So the kind of normal moral relationship between work and, and sustenance um, is going to be disruptive. That's going to be demoralizing. And then the respectful provision for family and love, concern, and care for children, spouses, and households, etc. All of that is disrupted, has to be set aside. So you really, total institutions then are forcing houses for changing persons, right? So you take people from the outside, you literally strip away the self that they were, and then, so that, that and that self dies, you mortify, kill off the old self, the death of the ego identity, right? And then, so you're left behind um, as this new, as this sort of almost a bare uh, nudity um, that is then going to be reconstructed. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, so the inmate world, I am getting warm here. So the inmate world, um, um, okay, so how do you get reconstructed? Well, um, you get a variety of things that happen to you. I wonder if we couldn't just kind of go through these things here. Um, maybe speed it up a little bit. Um, so the mortification self, you, you wind up decultured, desocialized, degraded, again, killing off, mortifying the civil self. Um, you get the degradation includes uh, this great welcome right at the beginning. Will breaking takes place. There's usually obedience tests that take place. Um, you know, in the great book that I would love to teach sometime to grad students up here, uh, Male Fantasies by um, Klaus Tavelite, he describes, uh, um, you know, military academies in Germany in the Wilhelmian era prior to uh, Nazism. And he, he, he describes the way that um, cadets in military academies were not given the rules. So you couldn't have a, a set of rules that you could study and know so that you could learn the rules and avoid them. You weren't given the rules. The way that you learned the rules is when you violated them. So therefore, the punishment that you received for rule infractions was the way that you became aware that a rule existed at all. So it was impossible for um, a young cadet in a military academy to avoid violating rules and to avoid punishment. And it's a weird notion. So why would you do that? Why would you create a military academy where the, uh, the cadets are not allowed to know the rules? And I think Goffman has the perfect answer here uh, the humiliation, the mortification, the, the, the beating is the whole point, right? That, um, that what you want to do is force people into conformity. You want to force them into a degraded position. You want to force them into a position of masochism, quite honestly, so that, so that you can sadistically uh, beat them down, beat the civil self out of them. So that's part of what's happening here in cadet school is that whatever, however highly you thought of yourself on the outside, once inside, you cannot escape being 
um, a deviant or someone who violates the rules, and then that kills off any uh, sense of self that you might have had in civil society, okay? All right, so the welcome then is that moment of intense will-breaking and intense obedience test uh, that occurs at the beginning of your induction into, say, like a military boot camp or, uh, or a prison. Intentional humiliations, uh, yeah, um, including posture and deportment. He talks about the, the desecration of the self um, um, where you lose physical, psychological, and even uh, information control of the self. He has a lot of good information in there about that, hard to read at times. Uh, the contamin contamination of the personal territory. He writes about even things like excrement, um, you know, when you're able to... Um, um, you know, eliminate waste from the body is something that most people do on their own uh, schedule, you know, listening to the, the bodily drives and that uh, total institutions disrupt that. And, you know, uh, maybe like he describes these Chinese uh, prison camps, so you're only given like like two minutes uh, twice a day uh, to do whatever uh, excretory functions uh, were necessary and you did it in public. And so it, it really disrupted the normal p privacy, the normal... Um, you know, uh, uh, dignity of the self, and um, it made it really, really hard to be someone who is responsive to your own internal uh, or, or organic drives. So uh, you're forced to lie in bed with the dead. Uh, there's a talk about, about, about a convent that has a begging, a soup begging tradition that the new novitiates have to go around. They're, they're not given their own, they're given an empty bowl, and they have to go around to the other sisters in the convent and get two spoonfuls of soup from each of them as they're eating their soup to get uh, a, some, somewhat of a, a bowl that's sort of made up of uh, saliva and uh, remnants of soup from uh, the other sisters. Again, intentionally humiliate. The humiliation is the whole point. Breaking down the civil self, uh, you know, degrading the civil self. Uh, page 28, he writes about rape, sexual coercion, assaults, groping. Again, he doesn't give a lot of details about that, thank God, but he does mention that this often happens. And almost any film, American film post-1970, that, that, that covers prisons is going to have some account at some point of uh, sexual assault and rape within prisons. And then, you know, almost any account of any other formal institution, um, uh, excuse me, total institution is going to have accounts of this as well. All right, so uh, uh, page 29, social contamination. Uh, people have forced contact with stigmatized others. He writes about uh, uh, people who are strongly anti-Semitic being forced to share cells with, uh, with Jewish people or Jewish people being forced to show, share cells with, uh, with anti-Semites. Uh, in, in, in America, race relations uh, had the same thing, right, that, that um, you know, um, racist Southern whites, for example, would be placed in cells with uh with blacks and so on, and so and so, you get this kind of this this that the symbolic contamination due to um, you know racial codings and yeah um, okay um, so so it's like, it's like a total breakdown of the of the categories of self from the outside total uh, demoralization. Uh, page thirty one, uh, new names are often given, uh, often uh, bullying nicknames um, and, and then numbers and that kind of thing. Uh, there's intervention in personal relationships. If you get a friendship, it's often disrupted. Uh, even a love relationship is often disrupted, those kind of things. You're often forced to betray friends and family and even friendships within. So he has all kinds of descriptions of that. Again, it's very demoralizing, the loyalties that you would normally have, the kind of sense of sacrifice that you would have as being disrupted here. So you can't be a moral self. Page uh, 35 writes about looping. Looping occurs in part, he says, because of desegregation. So in most workplaces, what you do at night or on your own is your own business. It only matters what you do in the workplace, but in a total institution, there is no outside. So anything that you do at night or in your so-called leisure time is still under the jurisdiction of the organization can be looped back against you. So, and then in um, most total uh, institutions, there's what he calls es echelon supervision or echelon authority. That means that you don't have a specific one person who has authority over you, but all staff members have authority over you and any of them can report you or uh, discipline or punish. So this tends to strongly uh, disrupt, again, the kind of the personal dignity of the self and the personal control of the self. So, so you, get the, you get this minute micromanagement of conduct in the self, uh, loss of personal uh, economy of action, he calls it, right? And a looping back of any 
um, deviance or any uh, discrepancy uh, winds up being, you know, looped back on as a sign of, of uh, badness or something like that on the part of the uh, person who does it. Okay. All right. Um, so this is all of page 44. This is a direct assault upon the self. Um, your infantilization takes place again. If you don't strip back the entire self and kill it, you at least take it back to childhood and then you're going to build a new self on top of that. So mortification of the self is the purpose, not uh, a side effect of the action. Okay. All right. So that's the so that's what happens as you go in. And then once you're inside, then you begin to rebuild uh, a self. So there's house rules. So he writes about the privilege system. So the primary way that you're rebuilt, again, you're given a uniform, you're given some of the welcome and that kind of thing, and you're prevented from reconstructing your civil self. But then you're given this privilege system, a set of house rules, usually very austere, uh, high, low level of, of uh, material uh, comfort and so on. But there are rewards and privileges that are handed out, taken for granted on the outside, that become normal. Right, you get points. Um, you know, I always think of the Harry Potter. You know, ten points for Gryffindor. Says you know um, that kind of thing, where 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 points are kept, and it, uh, and and that's a kind of reward and privilege system to a degree. Grades uh, function that way, um, and so on. So, um, so there's a reward and privilege system, a kind of scorekeeping that begins to orient the self. So you rebuild a new self by paying close attention to to the rules and to the scoring uh, system. It's a little bit like a video game, you know, that the self that you are in a video game is is determined by the point system, the scoring within it. All right, so punishments, uh, loss of reward and privileges, as well as rewards uh, are all part of this, uh, of, of the privilege system. So other aspects of the privilege system, adult subjection um, uh, to, um, to these things is peculiar to total institutions. Most adults don't care that much about grades, for example, but here you are locked into such a thing where you're worrying about very, very narrow little um, receipts of points and awards and that kind of thing and fear of punishment. Most adults don't fear punishment from other, other adults much in everyday life and you become hyper aware of that inside. So it's very demoralizing again. But that gives you the power, the total institution, the power then to reconstruct a self, to pre, to pre, to create a new regulatory and I, uh, and 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 moral order, a new form of identity linked to uh, conformity to this new um, privilege system. All right. So the release from the total institution is built into the privilege system. So that getting out is tied to obedience and privileges. Right. You get out only if you proceed through. You can get released for for good behavior. Uh, that kind of thing, right? But you've got to be in good standing to get out. We know that about college and universities, getting credit hours and grades uh, is how you get out and uh, and so on. So it's geared into the work system. Uh, the work within the institution is primarily performed by the inmates and they get people to do the work by tying that into the reward and privilege system. Often you're not paid in money, you're paid with points or with advancement in the privilege system. Okay, so taken together, the privilege system secures cooperation from persons who often have cause to be uncooperative. Yeah, so how do you get people who are prisoners to work uh, to, you know, restore and strengthen the prison walls? Well, you give them a little bit of privileges if they do. So the privilege system is the way that you take people who have been stripped to nudity or stripped to infantile behavior and you reconstruct them uh, in a bureaucratic way. So he writes about messing up or getting busted or demoted is a major problem. And at the moment when you're about to get out, if you're afraid of getting out, then you can mess up and wind up, you know, staying in. Okay, so another bureaucratic organization, privilege systems predominate grades, promotions, degrees, um, uh, salary adjustments, raises, bonuses, uh, you know, your annual review, uh, you get a score or review score, that kind of thing. Um, you know, distinctions, awards, all this kind of stuff. Uh, we're all used to this. Okay. All right. So, so yeah, once the self is mortified, then you begin to re, re-socialize it or rebuild it with a new institutional identity using the privilege system. And that is what uh, Goffman is going to mean by primary adjustment as we go into the next system. Okay. Okay. More about that as we go. Okay. So more about the privilege system. Um, so, yeah, so the privilege system and all of its bureaucratic elaboration constitutes what he calls the primary adjustment that an inmate makes to the total institution. Uh, from the formal standpoint of the staff, the primary thing, the first thing that we want you to do, the main thing we want you to do is to orient yourself to that. 
However, there are many secondary adjustments, he argues, uh, that are even more important for inmates uh, to hold onto enough self uh, to rebuild. So he claims that, that in, in, again, and this is, happens in a lot of Goffman's work, and it happens in a lot of this mid-20th century organizational theory, that the formal organization doesn't provide everything and that what it strips away often informal uh, work groups or informal work arrangements uh, make up for it. So if you lose the self, the self is formally stripped away and mortified as you get taken into a total institution, uh, a little bit of the self can be preserved through the informality of the relationship one has to the other inmates and into what he calls secondary adjustments is informal world. Okay. All right. So secondary adjustments are defined on page 54. These are unofficial, extra official practices that allow inmates to obtain forbidden satisfactions, things that the organization doesn't mention or doesn't want you to have, or to obtain permitted satisfactions and forbidden means. So like work and sleep and those kinds of things, find ways to do it. So uh, to become oriented to these secondary adjustments means that you become someone who gets good at working the system, learning the ropes, learning the angles, the gimmicks, the deals, and so on, the ins and outs of the informal uh, structure. There's huge informal control and an honor code among inmates related to these secondary adjustments. Because they're unofficial, they can be taken away. Hence, squealers, finks, rats, stoolies get nailed when they disrupt, right? Uh, um, right? Uh, Snitches get stitches, I guess, right? And it's that same kind of idea that this informal structure is really important to people's survival and to their comfort and, and uh, to the self that they've developed inside. And if it gets screwed up, it, it it's a loss for everyone. And so then there's all of this immense social control to prevent uh, it from being lost. So again, Goffin's telling us that even though the from the formal organizational structure, from the uh, organizational chart like we just saw in, in Dalton's book, um, the primary adjustment is all, is all that exists, but he's telling us here that it is these secondary informal adjustments that matter more, okay? So there's a huge informal social control. We mentioned that huge secondary adjustment, the fraternization process, uh, which means, you know, the relationship that one has with other inmates. So the inmate-to-inmate -inmate informal culture matters more than the staff-to-inmate formal relationship. You get a community uh, and social support that emerges. Um, so fully social selves emerge here, replete with hazing, teasing, harassment, alignments, clicks, and buddies. So you get the good and the bad. You get the heaven of positive social relationships and the utter hell of bullying and mobbing and that kind of stuff. So it's the informal uh, is where all the threat um, really lies or much of the threat really lies. And then it's also the place where uh, something like a, a self can be reconstructed. So secondary adjustments are probably more important. The informal world of fraternization with the other inmates is probably more important than the primary adjustment to the staff and to the official rules um, Yeah, in, in saving the souls and preserving the selves of the inmates in the total institution. So these things are really, really important. All right, so let's just hit a few other things then. Um, yeah, so fraternization with other inmates then um, has, is more important than contact with the staff. There's a dialectic that he uh, basically is what he's writing about. He's not using that term between the formal and the informal. And uh, what the staff takes away, the informal fraternization uh, gives back. But it also has the threat to worsen. So, again, because there's so much good and bad, positive and negative associated with the informal, it's kind of it, un, it, it, it doesn't have the same kind of regulations built into what the formal does. And hence, it becomes the thing that the inmates tend to orient themselves to. So really fast, getting out of the formal organization, right? Graduating out, uh, getting released means uh, paying attention to the formal rules and the staff, but making out, the term that he uses uh, throughout the book here, making out, finding a way to survive at somewhat well within the institution, means to pay full attention to the informal, uh, you know, fraternity. The culture that has emerged uh, unbidden, unplanned for, un to a degree uncontrolled among those who are thrust inside. So hazing, bullying, and, and, and mobbing can take place as well as buddies, loves, and posses can form. Okay, so this is really, really important here. Okay, so given then that we have, you have these two things, you then have the formal slash primary slash staff world. 
So the inmate has to orient themselves to that. And then they also have to orient themselves to the informal slash secondary slash uh, inmate world. Um, okay, so given the complexity of that, there are five different what he calls lines that um, that inmates can um, sort of adopt. So one of them is you can sort of give up on the whole thing, find it overwhelming, and engage in what he calls situational withdrawal, regression, or depersonalization. So we just sort of, it, like, this is overwhelming. My civil self has been killed off, and I don't really feel like rebuilding a new self. I'm too demor demoralized, depersonalized, and I'm going to sort of silently withdraw. And he has accounts of that throughout the book. So that's one. Become a loner. Just go off on your own and just write it out. Type two is the intransigent, the person who fights the staff, who, who becomes a kind of rebel all the time, constantly fighting. Type three is the colonized subject, the person inside who is happily, uh, uh, you know, the happy inmate, right? The, the model inmate, the model uh, prisoner, and so on. And they're just simply focused completely on making out, uh, not getting out of the total institution. Okay, um, there's the convert. Uh, this is the inmate that takes over the staff's viewpoint. Uh, they try to become, again, a perfect inmate who fully embraces the inmate role and tries to become, um, uh, again, even becomes a bit of a, um, a snitch or um, um, almost an extension of management uh, over the other inmates, tries to control them and become almost bossed around the other inmates as an extension of management. Uh, or of the staff. And then the last one is the playing it cool. This is the opportunistic defensive self so that one can eventually get out with an undamaged self. So so playing it cool means just, you know, treating everything as a lark, as a joke, um, uh, as a comedy. So nothing is tragic. You know, here you've got this real tragic sense of self here. And these are more, more comedic, I think, as it goes. Um, you know, the, the uh, Ken Casey's book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo Nest, you know, it's, it's you know, made into a play, uh, widespread, uh, performed, um, performed here in Ames, Iowa a few years back. Um, you know, the main, uh, Murphy, McMurphy, right? McMurphy? M Murphy or McMurphy? Can't remember. Anyway, the main character in One Flew Over the Cuckoo Cuckoo's Nest is the person who plays it cool uh, once inside, right? And they're just sort of focused on writing it out and getting out with a sense of self left. Okay, um, Work within total institutions then. Inmates do an enormous percentage of the total labor in the total institutions. There's an incentive to work, but it's a different kind of incentive than what's on the outside. Um, yeah, because you can't use, you know, paying for your children's college or something like that as a reason to work. So too little work is a huge problem for inmates because they become demoralized and bored. But too much work is also a problem. You wind up with uh, uh, total institutions becoming essentially work camps or gulags you know, uh, enforced slavery, total alienation, total possession by the staff, that kind of thing, big problem. Um, and then the individual who is work-oriented on the outside tends to become demoralized by the work system. The work ethic, uh, you know, can't help but erode inside. So the staff then depends almost entirely upon the labor of the inmate. So the staff doesn't so much work inside of the total institution as they manage the work of the inmates, right? So they are literally overseers or supervisors overseeing vision, vision um, uh, the work of others. All right, so the staff inmate divide is maintained with a lot of social dis distance. Usually there's a lot of communication that's, um, that is blocked across that divide. Uh, there are some um, uh, staff that actually serve as a kind of um, a defensive uh, line to prevent um, inmates from getting access to, say, doctors or from uh, upper officials in a prison. There's information and crawl across the divide that's carefully monitored. You know, inmates are excluded from staff knowledge, but then staff members are also excluded from inmate knowledge. So as a consequence, there isn't much trust usually across the divide that staff aren't trusted by the inmates and the inmates aren't trusted by the staff. They're usually mutual hostile camps, uh, two entirely different social worlds. They're in close proximity, but they might as well be in like different universes. Uh, however, the entire total institution somehow uh, belongs to the staff, not the inmates, right? So the sense of ownership is on the part of the staff. All right, so once you're inside, the goal is to rebuild the institutionalized self. Um, we'll just sort of skip that. We'll move on here. So again, the goal um, uh, in the 
primary organization, the primary orientation to the staff and to the official rules is to get out, but the informal structure is all about making out, surviving inside. Um, so the dominant things of inmate culture, self-regard, self-esteem is built around uh, a kind of excuse for why you're inside and apologetic, apologetics for why you're inside. Um, time in is time stolen from life. That's a gen so, so all of these are general themes that emerge wherever you have inmates, right? That you maintain self-esteem and self-regard inside of a prison or inside of an insane asylum by having an account of, for, of how you got in there and apologetics about it. You hate the time in. It's not living. It's something else. There's few compensatory gains from time in. No reform is actually possible. It actually turns out to be technically true in most American uh, institutions, not quite so in Europe, but Focuses upon removal activities. What you want to do is escape, psychologically escape from the heavy hanging time inside. So that becomes the main activity. Not escaping from the institution so much as escaping from the surveillance and supervision of the staff and escaping from the round of activities that's organized uh, for them in the primary way. So what they try to do then, inmates are going to try to live as much of their life as possible inside of the informal world of fraternization with the other inmates. Okay, since no one believes in reform or rehabilitation, getting out often generates relief anxiety, and thus you often get this desire not to get out but to stay in by making out. Okay, so that often happens. Here's an image of that regressed line uh, um, inside of St. Elizabeth's Hospital in the 1950s. Just sad to see demoralized self without any um, reserve left to sort of rebuild the new self inside. All right, so that sort of uh, completes most of our discussion then of the um, of the inmate world. Uh, you know, Goffman then writes about the staff world. Let's try to do this if we can in kind of a uh, a fast way. I can't quite get it all on here. Um, the staff then is engaged in processing of a unique kind of raw material person. So he talks about people work, the category of people work. That being a staff member in a total institution is different from working, say, uh, with things because uh, people have a body and a spirit and a self that must be processed and handled differently than, than other objects that you might process. So people work requires that one considers and respects outside statuses and, and fully aware that there are some um, rights that the inmate possesses that can um, uh, protect them and that could be utilized against those who are managing them inside. You know, you know, some of like like the Abu Ghraib prison scandal, some of the ICE uh, scandals um, of the last few years, we've seen that, you know, where external authority can have, um, can penetrate into a total institution and can, uh, you know, punish those who have uh, misbehaved within. All right, the dialectic of rights and management, the paradox of humane standards and institutional efficiency. Rights of the inmates have to be sacrificed often to preserve the life of the inmate. That's one of the claims. And, uh, and, and their safety, it also winds up, um, uh, tends to be used as a way to make uh, it efficient. There's a problem with personal possessions. They have to be maintained and stored. Parts of the body, hair, teeth, genitals have special meanings to them. They're also dangerous in certain ways. They have to be protected in all kinds of, of ways. One way to manage this paradox is a limit communication or in Congress between inmates and the outside world so that outsiders can't see how the inmates are handled. Uh, there's a dialectics of obedience. Inmates can resist, subvert, and set up the staff in all kinds of ways that can get them into trouble with this external authority. There's a dialectics of affection and affiliation in people work. They are, after all, people. And so the staff always has to kind of beware that, uh, that one can develop uh, affection and affiliation. There's kind of an involvement cycle, as Goffman writes about it. Their fraternization rules are officially handed down to control that, but this can nevertheless happen. So staff can become attached to inmates and inmates to staff. And I'm not talking sex here only, although that's certainly part of it, but friendships and, and um, other things as well. The, the official calling of the institution, its formal goals, and so on, are used as a framework of interpretation and justification regarding the staff-inmate interaction. So at moments when the staff seems to be violating the civil rights, such as they are, of the inmates, it's often justified or framed in terms of these external official goals of the organization. So the goals are important for providing keys and framing an interpretive scheme uh, so they don't really dictate what happens, but those official goals dictate the interpretation that's placed upon what happens. So people can be treated very rough. 
but if the organization is a caring, helping organization, uh, people are being treated rough for their own good. So it becomes a justification. So number five, the staff interpretive scheme. Um, the staff assumes that inmates deserve to be in, in prison or in whatever uh, confinement that they're in. Uh, they're the type of person that the institution is designed to handle. So, um, so if they're inside, they belong inside. And so the question of whether they're, they're rightfully there or not doesn't arise. Uh, the staff is morally responsible for directing. Um, uh, other people were morally responsible for getting him or her inside. Um, and then there is extreme deference at the beginning of the stay to ensure control and submission and conformity thereafter. Once an inmate is broken, they're always broken. That fascist sensibility of, of, of breaking the will, the welcome. So the staff knows that, that, that their view of the inmate is that they deserve to be there. Someone else got them there. But now that they're here, by God, they need to be broken. And so that, that, that domination, um, almost sadistic domination, and then the necessity for submission on the part of the inmate is, um, is part of the staff's function. And then again, this idea of, of uh, that there's a dialectics of work, um, responsibility, and authority. You know, the chapter ends with a little bit of discussion of institutional ceremonies that, um, that can um, stage for outsiders sometimes the division between staff and inmates. But in order to do that, as he says, in, in other words, once you get outsiders getting a view inside, then the staff and inmates have to cooperate as members of a performance team, kind of as as members of a single cast in a play to uh, perform well for outsiders view so these institutional ceremonies are actually moments when the normal separation between the staff and the inmates dissolves institutional work assignments um, is another place where the, the difference dissolves because the staff recognize that the inmates are doing important work so so because we're both workers there's a little bit of uh, a recognition uh, secondary adjustments are highly problematic for uh, total institutions. They're unplanned and they're not rationally organized. They're not engineered, yet they're also crucial for the continuing existence of the total institution. Inmates, not the staff and administration, invent and create that entire informal world of secondary adjustments. So most of what an inmate needs to make out to survive isn't provided by the organization directly. It's provided by the fraternal order of inmates inside of the um, organization. And I'm sorry to use fraternity. I, you, know, you could use sorority or, or, or degender it in some way, but just that the, that the, that the community of inmates uh, creates its own uh, social world that meets the needs of the selves that are in, in, included within. So the self is being preserved inside, not by the staff, but by the, the world of the inmates. So different types of secondary adjustments, make dues, working the system, informal economies, association with outsiders, and workable assignments. All of these things are described in at the end of the chapter. And uh, yeah, so 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 in the end, again, the staff and inmates are divided up into two completely different worlds. The meaning that each have is um, is determined by the position that they have, and yet these uh, moments occur where the division breaks down and that enables each you know the staff can take the uh, um, an adequate they develop an adequate theory of mind for the inmates they can understand how the inmate thinks because these moments of breakdown allow the staff and the inmates to become members of a single team basically and the same with the inmates the inmates can kind of better understand the, the staff they get humanized a bit because these barriers have broken down in institutional ceremonies and work assignments and so on. Okay. All right. So to wrap up then, what Goffman has done in this book is he has um, presented us with the organizational structure of total institutions, the most powerful bureaucratic complex organizations of the mid 20th century. He has described how the formal structure and formal organization essentially can kill off a civil self, mortify it, and then the self can be rebuilt in institutionally prescribed ways by um, you know, grades and credits and promotions and so on, the privilege system, and by punishments that can demote you and other things. And so that provides the primary way that the uh, institution reconstructs cells. However, the, uh, once inside of one of these organizations, human beings ourselves that have all kinds of social and existential needs that the organization may not have planned for. 
And it is the informal world of what he calls secondary adjustments that are emergent, spontaneously organized by the inmates themselves, the inmate world, the inmate-inmate connections, right? Inmate to inmate connections, that that's where the self that was important on the outside, the previous civil self, is kind of sustained and, you know, given a kind of lifeline um, where it can be preserved until one then gets out uh, eventually. So the world inside of an asylum is one only partly built and partly structured in a primary way by the staff using its formal rules and so on. It also maybe even predominantly, is built by the inmates themselves in an informal way, um, you know, um, with, with, with all of the um, sort of unregulated, unlimited power of a mob or a, uh, you know, a friendship network and so on. So, so inside then of these totally um, bureaucratized, powerful institutions that grab hold of individuals on all sides and keep them there 24-7 for years, there's still room for individual agency. There's still room for freedom. And that, and, that, and that, to me, is the hopeful part of this book, is that even in the 20th century's most powerful organizations, human beings still had room uh, to be free and to construct something like a life that meant something to them. He's going to really return to this theme in the next section that we're going to talk about, the underlife of the total institution, uh, at the end. Okay. Thank you. Hope this helped.